So Robin was a staff member actually of ours from 2001 to 2003. And she also participated in our Jamaica program and taught there with us. Um, that was almost our last program there. We did one more after that. And then, uh, then we moved to Belize. So you should come to Belize sometime, uh, Robin. Yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> So Robin uh, is a marine biologist with a PhD in ecology, evolution, and marine biology from the University of California, Santa Barbara. And she has a, her MS and her BS uh, in Earth Systems from Stanford University. Um, Robin has a passion for teaching science at all levels, from elementary school through graduate school. She's currently the marine science and biology professor at California State University, Monterey. Monterey Bay, and works on fishery science projects for sustainable seafood organizations around the world. And I did not know this before, Robin, but I didn't know you worked at Sea Watch, which I thought was really wild. And uh, it said she was the fisheries program manager at the Monterey Bay Aquarium sea Seafood Watch Program. You know, mm -hmm. the little cards you guys, we hand out to you and, and we always say, hey, watch what you're eating for seafood. Well, in that role, she oversaw the scientific uh, reports that form the basis of the program's wild seafood purchasing recommendations. So she has traveled extensively, conducted field research all over the world in marine protected areas. Um, in South Africa, coastal resource management for the Pacific Island nation of Palau, among her other far-flung places. So now she has settled herself and her family in California. And she has very graciously agreed to talk to us today about sustainable fisheries. I'm done talking and turn it over to Robin. Great. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, I think my daughter wanted to quickly say something and then I'll get started. Go ahead. Wonderful. Um, she also teaches science at my class. She comes in about once a month, or she did. Now she comes in every week. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm her teacher every day. Yeah. Yeah. That's excellent. Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, well, thanks everybody for, um, for listening. I am uh, really excited to talk to you all today about something that is a, a passion of mine. As Sherry mentioned, I worked with the Seafood Watch program of the Monterey Bay Aquarium for uh, many years and even uh, now continue to do work in the field of sustainable fisheries. So that is what I'm gonna talk to you all about today. Um, so to begin with, what is sustainable fisheries? And usually when people think about um, what is sustainable seafood or what is sustainable fisheries, the first thing you think about is, oh, you don't want to eat a fish that's endangered, or you don't want to eat a fish that we're fishing too hard, we're taking too much of them, and there's not leaving enough behind to, to reproduce and to replenish themselves. And that's absolutely true, but there's actually a lot more to sustainable fisheries than just that. So this uh, little square over to the left that says harvest mortality, um, that's a really fancy way of saying basically what I just said. You don't want to fish any kind of fish that you're eating too hard, too much that it can't continue to, its populations can't continue to reproduce and grow and replace themselves. But that's only one of the kinds of impacts that fishing can have. So the next uh, circle up there, physical impact of the fishing gear, what that means is a lot of our fishing gear that we use, especially the big industrial fisheries that catch things like cod that we eat a lot of, um, they tend to be these really huge nets that are dragged along the bottom of the seafloor. And if it's not done in the right way or in the right place, they can actually damage all kinds of things that are living on the seafloor. Things like corals and sponges. And these are habitats themselves. So the corals, I'm sure you know, form coral reefs that are habitat for all kinds of different animals um, and very long lived as well. So if a fishing gear damages a uh, sponge or coral, it could take a really long time for that to come back. So that's the what's called a habitat impact. And then there's also um, what's uh, written here as bycatch. Uh, and bycatch is basically anything that is unintentionally caught, anything other than the fish that you're trying to catch that people wanna eat that also gets caught up in the net and may die. And that includes um, other kinds of fish. Sometimes there's other kinds of fish that just people don't wanna eat, they don't taste that good, or maybe they're too small. Um, but it also includes things like seabirds, marine mammals, sea turtles, all of those types of animals can be caught as bycatch and many of them are endangered um, or threatened. And so some of the biggest impacts of fisheries that we need to be aware of are um, impacts that they have on these endangered species, the unintended catch or bycatch of those species. 
and then finally, as I'm sure you know, everything in an ecosystem interacts. We've got um, complex food webs in the ocean, just like there are on land. And so if you, for example, if you take too much of little tiny fish like sardines or anchovies, that starts to impact the animals that feed on them, like seabirds and marine mammals. And so that's what's called a food web effect or a trophic effect, um, often just kind of generalized as an ecosystem effect. So all of these things are the things we think about when we decide if a fishery is sustainable. So at Seafood Watch, where I used to work, uh, we created a system of determining if a fishery was sustainable based on four uh, types of criteria or four um, types of impacts within our criteria. So we define sustainable fisheries as fisheries that have healthy stocks and stocks is kind of another word for population that's used in fisheries. So whatever it is that you're targeting and fishing is not being fished too hard and they're abundant enough. Low bycatch, especially not harming endangered species. Good strong management that's based on science and minimal impacts on the ecosystem, including the habitat and the food web. So just for now, I'm gonna focus in on the first of those, healthy stock impacts, and um, just give you a little bit of a sense of how we're doing in the US and in the world in terms of how sustainable our stocks are. So first, the good news. Um, this is an infographic from NOAA Fisheries, which is the organization, a government agency actually, that manages US fisheries. And they are able to categorize our fisheries in two different ways. The first is, are the fish stocks abundant? Are they healthy? Are there enough of them? And we see that 85% um, of the fish stocks that we have this data on in the US are abundant enough. So they're what's called not overfished versus 15% that are overfished. The other question you can ask is, is the fishing mortality sustainable? So in other words, are we fishing them too hard? Are we taking them out too fast? And again, it's pretty good news because more than 90% are not being fished too hard. They're being fished at a good uh, sustainable level. So that's the good news. Um, and this is not an accident. This is something that has come to be over decades and decades of really hard work by legislators and environmental groups passing um, some of the strongest legislation to regulate fisheries in the world and really hard work by a fisherman as well to comply with those regulations and to innovate and come up with ways that they can still catch the fish that we all enjoy eating while following the rules so that they don't overfish. So um, if you zoom out a little bit and look at how are we doing globally, the picture is not so good. And this is understandable because it takes a lot of a lot of money, really, and capacity to manage fisheries well. It takes a lot of science, people collecting data, it takes a lot of enforcement, things like, um, for example, where I live in California, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, who go out and make sure everyone's following the rules. And so in other places in the world, they haven't been able to do that as effectively. So if you look at this chart, um, all you really need to know is that orange are the percent of stocks that are overfished, which means they're not doing well, they're, they're being depleted, and the blue are the ones that are doing okay. So you can see that about a third of our fish stocks in the world actually are overfished or depleted, and that number is starting to increase over time. So things are kind of getting worse. So even though the US situation is pretty good, it's not quite as rosy in the global picture. So why does that matter? Now this is a crazy, crazy graph and uh, map. And I put this up not because I expect anyone to be able to follow any one of those individual arrows and make sense of it, but that because I wanna emphasize how incredibly complicated seafood trade is. Seafood is actually one of the very most traded commodities in the entire world and the most traded uh, food commodities. So um, what that means is a lot of the fish that we catch here in the US, we export it. A lot of the fish that we eat here in the U.S. is imported from all over the world. We import a lot from Asia, we import a lot from South America, but basically everything's connected all over the world. So even though we can say, well, our U.S. fisheries are doing good, so we don't have to worry about it, that's not really the case, because if you like to eat fish, you're probably eating fish that comes from all these different places around the world. So we do have an obligation to help make sure that those fisheries are sustainable too. But also we have the power to do that. And this is what I think is exciting is because we're buying, we the US is buying fish from all over the world. That means we as consumers have the power to actually help influence the way fisheries operate in Thailand or in Vietnam or in Chile. 
so it's a, a really good power and responsibility to make that change, um, to use our power as consumers. So how do we actually do that? If you care about fish being sustainable and you want to help, what can you do? And that brings me to the program, as Sherry mentioned, I worked for, for many years called the Seafood Watch Program. It's a sustainable seafood ratings program under the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And um, you may be familiar with our pocket guides. You kind of see them all over the place, especially aquariums all over the country. Um, that's a, there's a picture of it on the bottom of this slide. And so the pocket guides are sort of the iconic thing that Seafood Watch produces. And if you haven't seen them, it's a little card that folds up that you can stick in your wallet or your pocket. And they've got a list of what they call best choices. It's coded green, a list of good alternatives coded yellow, and a list of fish or seafood products to avoid that's coded red. Um, and there's a whole complicated set of criteria and evaluations and big, long peer reviewed reference reports that go behind all those ratings, which is what I worked on. Um, when I worked there. But what you see as the consumer is you see this simplified pocket guide, or if you want a little more in-depth information, they actually have an app um, for both iOS and Android. So you can download this app and you can put in the app, I wanna know what kind of lobster to eat. That's a big one over there in Maine, for example. And it will tell you, you know, well, the lobster from Maine is a good alternative and the lobster from somewhere else maybe is a void. Um, and so you can make those comparisons if you want even more detail than that, you can go to seafoodwatch.org on the website and you can actually download those reports that I mentioned that I used to work on and you can find probably, you know, 80 to 100 page reports for each one of these little recommendations. So there's a lot of information. Um, and so what we ask is we ask the consumers to take their pocket guide or take their app whenever you go to a restaurant that you're gonna um, order seafood at, whenever you go to the grocery store, and, and look up your seafood and see if it's sustainable and, and choose sustainable choices. So is this working? Is this helping move the needle and improve fisheries around the world? Well, I'm gonna start with um, the kind of bad news. <laughs> this is the bad news. Is, uh, this is a couple years ago now, but I don't think it's changed too much. When I was at Seafood Watch, we initiated some market research to try to figure out if we were making a difference and how, how we were making a difference. And so one of the first questions you have to ask is, okay, we pr we're printing millions of these little pocket guides and we literally do print millions. And they go and are distributed to zoos and to aquariums and to schools and all over the place. Um, but how many people are actually using them? And so that was one of kind of step one, the question. And we found out that only, um, only about 5% of people regularly use them and more than 90% of people never use them. So um, that's kind of a, a little bit of a depressing statistic, right? Because it's hard to make a difference in all this work and research that we're doing if people aren't using it. But here's the good news. In spite of that happening, in spite of that being the case, we have found that the vast majority of retailers, and by retailers, that means basically grocery stores. It's the places that you go and you buy the fish from. Um, the vast majority of them are making a commitment or have already made a commitment to sell only sustainable seafood. So that doesn't mean that if you walk into Safeway tomorrow, well, you probably can't do that, but <laughs> if, you, if you were to do that, that all the seafood that you would see is sustainable, but what it means is, to use Safeway as an example, Safeway has a partner. Their partner is called Fishwise. Fishwise is a little, um, a small environmental nonprofit group that's based really close to where I am. It's based in Santa Cruz. They work really closely with Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so they partner together with grocery stores and they will say, okay, you have five years to get all the red list seafood out of your stores. And then they'll help them do that. They'll help them find alternatives. You can switch this tuna for that tuna and that sort of thing. So not all of these retailers are 100% sustainable right now, but they're all on the path. And so that's a way we sort of, we don't have to worry about getting uh, you know, the 350 million consumers in the US on board using the pocket guides or using the apps. We go to the retailers and there's about 25 of them that make up about 90% of their sales. And all of them right now are working with a non, uh, uh, an NGO, which is a, a nonprofit organization, an environmental group, uh, to put a seafood, sustainable seafood commitment in place. So that's the good news. That's, and the important thing I think to realize is that didn't just happen by accident either. 
that happened because of people going to restaurants and going to grocery stores and carrying their pocket guides and saying, um, do you sell sustainable seafood? How do I find out You know what you're selling is sustainable? And that's what we call buzz. And basically after hearing this buzz, hearing enough demand from consumers that they wanted sustainable seafood, all these retailers signed up. There's also a little bit of a competitive effect. So once some of the big ones like Walmart signed up, others signed up too, because they didn't want to be left behind and have that bad PR and that sort of thing. That's so as a, can I ask you a question? And that's what I was about to ask is, um, and let me just say to everybody, there's a chat box down below at the bottom of the screen. And if you have questions when Robin's done or just sometime during the talk, um, write your questions there, okay? And then I'll share them with her when she's done. But how, so is that how you find out? Because my kids hate, I use my seafood watch all the time <laughs> on my phone and yeah. I embarrass them all the time. But it's often not like the people that work at the stores, when I ask often don't, aren't clear yeah. about it. You know, I'll say, well, why are you selling grouper? Or, you know, do you, so I guess, how do you find out? Do you just have to ask? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, that Sherry is a great question and probably the most common in terms of like well-informed questions, at least probably the most <laughs> common one, because it's very true. And even when you go to a relatively well-informed um, and helpful uh, retailer or restaurant, they often, they just don't have the information that you need because it gets very detailed. If you really look right. at the Seafood Watch app, you might need to know, was it caught by long line or by troll or by hand line? And usually they don't have that information. Right. Um, and I was, I was actually shocking to me when I started, like I expected that businesses at least knew where they were buying seafood from and what species it was, but they don't. There's this really long supply chain and information is just getting lost along the way. Um, so what we tell people is to ask, and you ask not because you're gonna get a satisfying answer, because you probably won't, but <laughs> you ask because it's, been, it's part of the buzz again, and the more people ask, the more the companies realize they need to figure out the answer. And so we, um, a lot of the work the sustainable seafood movement is doing right now is on what's called traceability, which is just this really simple concept of everybody who sells seafood should be able to, to trace it back through the supply chain to tell you where it was caught, what it was caught with, and even what species it is. Yeah, that is the difficult thing. I'll see things and I think, I don't know if it's okay. How was this caught? They don't, they don't have any clue. And you'll say, how yeah. do you, where, who do you get it for? Like, who would I ask? And then they are like, well, we don't know. It's, yeah. It's yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's okay. often going to be the case, but you're doing the right thing by asking, you know, if you always, if you want to be a hundred percent sure you can, there's certain fish you can always feel good about buying. There's ones that have a, what's called the Marine Stewardship Council little logo, which is like a blue check mark fish shape. And, um, their uh, Whole Foods Market, for those who have one nearby and, and can afford it, is a good option because they don't sell any red list seafood. But um, otherwise, you just keep asking and know that, that things are improving and retailers are working on it. Um, so essentially, the way I would describe what we call our theory of change, how we are trying to influence and improve um, fishing around the world, is first, you have consumers creating that demand. And like we talked about, you can't necessarily do that just by going to the store and only buying the sustainable seafood because there's not really enough people doing that that it's really gonna shift sales that much. And even if you are one of the people who do it, you don't always know exactly what you're buying and you can't always get the answers. But you create the buzz and they hear enough of that buzz and businesses make a commitment to work with us or with Fishwise or with somebody to sell um, only sustainable seafood. And the more businesses do that, the more the fishermen or the regulate, regulators of the fishery um, make, then are incentivized to improve their practices. And so I'm gonna give you guys an example, because this is all a little bit abstract, I realize. I'm gonna give you an example of a time that that, that, that happened. Um, so for this example, I'm going back to these core four aspects of sustainable fishing. And this time, instead of sustainable stocks, I'm going to focus in on the bycatch issue, this unintended catch of, of threatened or endangered species in particular. And the case study that I'm going to talk to you about is about um, turtle bycatch in shrimp trawls. So um, shrimp in um, the Gulf of Mexico and a lot of other places in the world are caught with these giant nets called trawls, um, bottom trawls, because they go on the seafloor. 
and they tend to be very unselective, which is to say they'll kind of catch whatever's in their path. Um, and historically, there was a really big issue of sea turtles getting tangled in these nets and drowning, and it was having a huge, um, a huge effect on the sea turtle populations, which were already endangered, and their populations were really threatened by this practice. So um, a couple of fishermen working together with NOAA and some engineers, it was this great collaborative effort to come up with a solution, and they came up with what's called a turtle excluder device, and they call them TED for short. And I'm gonna show you just this little animation of how that, how that works. Um, so you have your fishing boat, you have your trawl, it's scooping everything up. Um, and so if a turtle ends up in the net, it sort of triggers this almost trap door where it escapes through the turtle excluder devices. But there's a grate you can see, um, so the shrimp actually will go right through the grate. So you don't, the fishermen don't lose very many shrimp because they go through the grate and they get caught. Um, sorry. So they will, they will go through that grate and they'll get caught in the end of the net. But bigger things, including the sea turtle and other bycatch too, like other fish and rays and so forth, escape through that turtle excluder device. Um, so they were actually found to be really effective. If they're installed properly, they reduce um, sea turtle bycatch by almost 99%. So making it pretty much completely solving that problem. And by implementing them, we've started to see sea turtle populations turn around. But um, a lot of fishermen didn't necessarily want to use them, and that was particularly the case in the state of Louisiana. Um, it's hard to really explain why. I think it was just kind of a cultural uh, issue of not wanting to be told what to do by the federal government <laughs> more than anything. But um, a little timeline of what happened is that um, device that I just showed you, the turtle excluder devices, were developed in the 80s. And by 1987, the U.S. required all of our shrimp uh, fishermen to use them on their shrimp trawls. And that's when we started to see the bycatch of turtles go way down. But in that same year, Louisiana passed their own law that actually prohibited their state officials from enforcing that federal law. So this is a really weird thing that has to do with state and federal law in the US, but essentially most of the fishing is pretty close to shore. Most of it occurs in state waters, not further offshore in federal waters. And so the enforcement is being done by state agents. Just like I mentioned earlier where I live in California, it's done by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. In Louisiana, it's done by the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, and they were not allowed to give a citation to a boat that wasn't using a turtle excluder device. And so that basically meant you might as well not have had the law at all. And it meant that there, most of the fishermen were doing it anyway because they didn't want to catch turtles, but there were a few kind of bad actors that just wanted to, to get away with not having to you know, pay for the gear or they were worried they would lose shrimp or for whatever reason, they didn't do it. And so we weren't saving as many turtles as we wanted to. So over the course of the next really couple of decades, there was a lot of effort to change this, to change this law. There were a lot of nonprofit organizations, environmental groups that were working to try to get the, chain, the law changed and it just, it wasn't politically viable. Nobody wanted to kind of stand up to the fishermen and tell them what to do. So it just kept failing. Um, so fast forward to 2013 and Seafood Watch at that time was going through a lot of changes and starting to do more and more detailed reports. So in the past, we had had just a blanket um, good alternative, yellow ranking for any shrimp from the Gulf of Mexico, US fishery. And then in 2013, we published a report that looked at each state individually. And every state got that good alternative, yellow rating except Louisiana. And Louisiana got a red because of this law. And as soon as that happened, Whole Foods Market dropped them and a bunch of other kind of smaller local businesses dropped them as well. And by 2015, the law had been changed. And the law was changed because it was actually initiated by the Louisiana Shrimp Task Force, which is an industry group. So it was the industry standing up and saying, hey, you know, legislators, we want you to change this because we want to be able to sell our shrimp to Whole Foods, which pays a great price into all these other markets. So um, just to follow up on that a little bit, this is an article, or this is a, a screenshot of an article that came out back in uh, 2015 when all of this was happening, that they were passing a bill to start enforcing the turtle excluder device regulations. And they actually quoted um, this guy, Mark Abraham, who was the chairman of the industry group called the Louisiana Shrimp Task Force, basically saying, yeah, it was because of Seafood Watch and it was because of this boycott 
um, that businesses weren't buying our shrimp anymore that we decided we're gonna go ahead and make that change. So that's an example in practice of how you get from starting with the consumer buzz, that's what got Whole Foods and other, uh, other sellers like that to sign up uh, to only sell sustainable seafood. Also starting with the good science that made that you know, differentiation and leads all the way to changes on the water. That's, that's the goal of how the system works. So with that said, I've told you, I've shown you this figure now um, a few times with the four sort of buckets or types of impacts that we look at at Seafood Watch. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is we're starting, and not just Seafood Watch, but the whole sustainable seafood movement is really starting to expand what we consider when we talk about sustainability. So the first aspect of that I wanna share, and you might have been wondering about this or noticed it was missing, is, um, carbon footprint or greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, so I'm sure you guys are familiar with climate change, probably the biggest environmental concern of our time. Um, fishing and farming seafood both, they have a carbon footprint too, uh, but it can vary a lot. So this graph here is a graph of how much, what is the, essentially the carbon footprint or how much carbon dioxide is emitted from different types of food production. And on the graph right now, you can see chicken, dairy, and beef. Um, so you guys maybe have heard that, you know, one of the things you can do if you want to lower your own carbon footprint is eat less beef because it's a really um, carbon intensive food. Um, chicken's a little bit more like average. Um, so where does seafood fall on this, you know, comparison? It turns out it depends. Seafood, you can't just pick a point on this graph. It's all over the place. So probably the most sustainable thing you can eat if you want to eat an animal protein is mussels. Actually not wild caught, but farmed mussels have almost a zero carbon footprint and they're very sustainable in other ways too. Take something, take something like salmon farmed. Usually most of the salmon we eat in the United States is farmed. It turns out the process of farming a salmon, it is pretty much like chicken in terms of its carbon footprint and a lot of other impacts too. What about tuna? Tuna um, is one of our favorite fish here in the US. And this is just to show you how complicated things can get. If you catch tuna with persanes, it's got a really low carbon footprint down here closer to mussels. If you catch them with some of the other gear, it's actually higher than dairy and edging up there towards more like beef. Um, so it gets really complicated really fast. So there is no you know, rule of thumb like, yeah, you should eat seafood instead of chicken if you wanna lower your carbon footprint, it's complicated. So Seafood Watch um, has not historically considered greenhouse gas impacts. And when you see the green, yellow, or red, it doesn't include that. It also, I should say, it doesn't include the transport either. So a lot of people, when we talk about carbon footprint of seafood, the very first thing they think is like eat local so that you're not shipping it so far. Um, and, it, and I think there's a lot of good reasons to eat local, certainly to support your local fishermen if you live in a fishing community. But as far as carbon footprint, it turns out that most of the emissions come from producing or catching the fish and very little of it actually comes from transport, except for, and this is very rare, but except for when you have something that's flown by plane. So, and that doesn't generally happen unless you are eating something like you're eating in some high-end uh, sushi restaurant in New York City and you've got this fresh tuna that, you know, came from Palau yesterday or something. That um, means it was flown there. And that's a very carbon intensive way um, to do things. But the rest of the time, it's usually shipped by ship or by rail or something like that, and those are pretty low carbon footprint. So the, um, so, kind of, so the point is that seafood can be all over the place in terms of its carbon footprint. And so as people are concerned and wanting to lower their carbon footprint, they need information. So Seafood Watch partnered with a, a university called Dalhousie in Canada, and they created the Seafood Carbon Emissions Tool. And so this is a website, and you can go to this website and you can see some kind of overview data. So what is sort of the range of different carbon emissions by type of seafood? And you can then dig into it and you can do a search and you can look at the difference between, you know, the tuna caught by cursane and the tuna caught by long line and so forth. Um, so I'm gonna then shift to another way we're expanding the definition of sustainability and that is thinking about people, the impacts on people, what we call social sustainability and human rights. Um, 
So this uh, picture comes from a story that was done by the Associated Press, or the AP, is actually a picture of a fisherman who had been um, enslaved. And it turns out that there's modern slavery in the seafood industry. There are people who are kept as slaves on fishing boats. And um, this was kind of, the story was uncovered back in 2014. And as part of the process that the investigative journalists did in discovering this, they also freed um, over 2,000 slaves who had been um, captive like this man in a, on an island in Indonesia. Um, but there's many, many more slaves still in the industry. Um, so this still needs to be rooted out and it still needs to be fought. Um, one of the things that was most disturbing about this article when it came out is that they actually tracked and traced that fish that was being caught by the boats that they found using slave labor and they tracked it all the way back to the US market, being sold in Walmart and in Costco and all the places that you know that you and I shop. Um, so this was very, obviously very disturbing to the American consumers and businesses because nobody wants to support this practice. So again, Seafood Watch and others have been working on this. Um, oh, I just have this image, um, which I think is a really heartwarming image of the fishermen after they were um, freed by the process started by this investigative reporting. And so some of these guys had been, um, they hadn't seen their families or been home for over 10 years. They'd been enslaved in, on these fishing boats and you can see just the joy and relief as they are heading home. And this is a picture of one of them being reunited with his mom and his sister. Um, so really just hammers home how important this issue is. So, so Seafood Watch has partnered with uh, a couple organizations, Sustainable Fisheries Partnership and Liberty Asia, to try to figure out where this is happening so that we can help be a part of stopping it. So uh, the image on the left is a screenshot from an article that came out in NPR a couple of years ago. And um, the image on the right is a picture of the database that Seafood Watch is working on. This is very much a work in progress. In fact, if you go to this website right now, and I could give you the link, but if you go to it right now, it won't really let you in because they're in, they're changing everything up and it's in a beta version right now. But the ultimate goal is that you'd be able to go and search for uh, a country and a type of fish, say tuna from Taiwan, and it will tell you how high risk it is that that is, um, that fishery it can be, uh, using, might be using slave labor. A lot of this is might be and could be in risk because, you know, we don't have hard data because obviously nobody reports that they are using slave labor, but there are certain risk factors that you can measure. And so as a result of doing this, we're now trying to work with all those business partners that I mentioned earlier on and make sure that they can be a part of getting this process to stop as soon as possible. Um, so that's pretty much it. So just to sum up, um, Programs like Seafood Watch and others are harnessing the power of markets to improve fisheries. We have the businesses uh, demanding for a change and that's pushing fisheries to improve. And that's all happening because consumers have asked for it. There's some successes, there's a lot left to achieve and we're continuing to increase what we uh, consider when we think about sustainability. And so uh, thank you for listening and I would be happy to, to answer questions now. I'm gonna unmute myself here. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you. That was actually, that was great. Oh, really, uh, really wonderful information. And uh, I, I'm curious um, about the whole slave situation. Is it better? I mean, do they think it's better now that it's kind of been brought out into the open? Yeah, I think it's, it's getting better. So it's not solved. Um, it is, um, the, if you read the articles that came out, the AP story back from 2014, um, it's not exclusive to Thailand, but sort of the big stories that were breaking were largely from Thailand. They were, I would say, the most notorious for having this problem. Um, right. In Thailand, when this story came out, they got um, sort of a, a, it's like a ranking that the US State Department gives, and then Europe does something similar where they say, you know, we, we recognize that there's a problem with human rights going on in this country and that can affect their like most favored trade nation status and all of that, so it's a big deal. Um, so they've been trying to improve and I think that they, they have improved a lot because it used to be the government really turned a blind eye or even maybe facilitated some of this happening. And now um, I wouldn't say it's 100% routed out, but the government is starting to try to stop it and enforce it.
Excellent. All right, so I've got a couple questions here for you. Ty, I don't know if Ty Gromer or not, but how does the method of catching change the carbon footprint? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And it's just, um, the carbon footprint of fishing in particular, as opposed to fish farming, is almost all fuel use, boat fuel use. So the two big things that affect it are how far do you have to go out or how basically how long do you have to fish or, or fish for and how many miles do you have to travel to get each fish and how heavy essentially is it. So if you think about the bottom trawls that I mentioned, think about all the drag that that creates, dragging a big heavy net along the bottom. That takes a lot more fuel to go the same distance than it would be if you didn't have gear dragging on the bottom. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, so like the tuna that I mentioned, the persane, the reason that that's so um, low carbon footprint is because they don't have to go very far to get a lot of tuna because it's a very efficient way of fishing where the tuna are all in a big group, usually around like an aggregating device, and they just cast this big net and get a whole bunch of tuna at once. Whereas the one by one methods, which are actually more sustainable in other ways, they have to travel farther to get each tuna if they're caught by the cook and line. And so that's why they burn more fuel. Okay, makes sense. Okay, another one. Um, is the salmon industry sustainable? Okay, that's a great question too. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, there's different types of salmon that you can buy. So in the US about 10%, uh, I think of what we eat is wild, mostly from Alaska. It's a really, good sustainable fishery for the most part. You know, there's always nuance and detail, but I would say yes to Alaska wild seafood and also California, Oregon, Washington, that's all pretty good. Um, the other 90% is farmed. Most farmed salmon right now is on Seafood Watch's red list. Um, so it's not really sustainable and I didn't get into aquaculture because it's got a whole different set of impacts but there's like pesticides that they use and antibiotics and it pollutes the water and the feed, like salmon is a carnivorous fish. So they actually catch wild fish and grind it up to feed the salmon. So those are some of the impacts um, in the salmon industry, but it is improving. So the salmon industry has actually gotten a lot better over the last 10 years. And there's a few kind of yellow, like big salmon farming operations that are yellow now and probably will be more in the near future. Hopefully. So we should avoid uh, farmed. It's for the most part, yeah, I would shoot, shoot for wild if you can. And, you know, I don't know, being on the West Coast, I don't know how easy it is to find that stuff on the East Coast. I know for us, it's pretty easy out here, but. Yeah, um, I'm in I'm in Michigan right now, so yeah. no, it's not as easy. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so Grace is asking, does the data we see, uh, does the data we see account for IUU fishing? If you could explain IUU fishing. And how are stores and restaurants held accountable when they work with sustainable seafood groups? Okay, those are both great questions. So the first question, um, IUU fishing, for those who don't know, IUU is an acronym that stands for illegal, unregulated, and unreported, um, which actually are three pretty distinct things, even though they're all lumped together. Um, the, so I would say partially, <laughs> the data, the un unregulated fishing, just because it's unregulated doesn't mean that we're not accounting for it. So I think that's often accounted for the unreported kind of by definition is not included in the data. Um, the illegal fishing is usually also unreported. So it's usually not accounted for in the data. And so you can see, you know, scientific analyses that will try to estimate that, but it's kind of a lot of, of guesswork. Um, but yeah, for the most part, that's excluded from the data because we just don't know those numbers. And then um, are so, store, the stores and restaurants held accountable when they work with these groups? Yeah, um, it's it's really challenging to do that. I mean, in theory, if a, if an organization makes, you know, if a restaurant, say, makes a commitment and then they break it, um, the group could say, well, we're not going to work with you anymore. Or they could, they could even publicize that they broke their commitment, right? Um, in practice, that hasn't happened to my knowledge at all because um, the partners, you know, the NGOs don't want to lose those partners. They don't want to kind of scare businesses away. But what does happen is you can kind of think of the NGO community, the, the sustainable um, seafood community as having like a good cop, bad cop dynamic. Um, not like, they're not really coordinating with each other, but like Seafood Watch and groups like them are the good cop and then Greenpeace primarily is the bad cop and they will call out anybody who is not doing everything they should do. Um, right. So they, they do a lot to hold these groups accountable. That's good. Uh, Parker's asking, what is the carbon footprint of a squid? Do oh, you know? 
That is a really good question. Um, I would have to look, I don't know off, off the top of my head, so I could look at the tool and see if it's in there and, and get back to you. I think that it's probably pretty low because it's first same. So just <laughs> usually like the, at least the squid boats that are out here that I see from my, from my window sometimes are right. first same, which is a pretty, a pretty low impact way of fishing. She's, she's tired of you being on the Zoom calls all the time. So we so. won't keep you too much longer. But, uh, <laughs> All parents are going through this, Robin. So, <laughs> you know, um, uh, Zebby asks, are initiatives like the Billion Oyster Project in New York City just looking to the filtering benefit mm -hmm. now or consumption? I think they are looking towards consumption too. And I don't know for sure about the Billion Oyster Project exactly. But yeah, there's a lot of a rise of like what's called regenerative aquaculture, which is like right. farming seafood that's not just like low impact but actually positive impact and oysters are one of those kelp is another one and because uh, uh, zebby's school harbor school is uh one of the co-sponsors oh that's so cool oyster project so that's, that's very awesome cool. yeah bruce is here bruce uh -huh. steven he's hey, lots bruce. of he to oh, hi. robin <laughs> you. and time. uh and they work together, you guys. So that's and what is uh bruce wants to know what's your favorite seafood oh what's my favorite seafood um probably salmon i really like salmon we do um we do fish tacos every week that's our favorite way to eat it <laughs> suck it, honey. Suck it. i know i like uh, haddock and things too it's like yeah, it's <laughs> over in like uh three minutes i think yep they it'll be over soon. Just, just make sure to to mute yourself though tony if you can no i was <laughs> um <laughs> thanks uh, good to see you, Tony. Have there been any effects, uh, James asked this, from radiation on Pacific fishes from Fukushima disaster? Um, probably some, you know, some effects on the population. It's not something that I, I think it's been, um, there's been more concern raised than is really, you know, what we've seen in terms of, certainly in terms of the safety of the seafood. I don't think there's much concern that I know of from eating that uh, fish and um, I haven't seen any data on, on like populations being affected. The, what I know was much more impactful and really problematic was the Gulf, the BP oil spill. Right. Um, that happened, I think, 10 years ago now in the Gulf. Yeah. Yeah, that took, that's, I don't even know if that's probably still going on at this point, the yeah. effects from it. So, yeah. Um, so that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. If, uh, Kathy and Bruce, if you want to stick around for a minute and say hi to Robin, we can, we can do that if Robin, you have a minute. Sure, um, yeah. to, to everybody else, thanks so much. It was wonderful to see you. I'm going to post this on our YouTube channel and I'll let you know when it's available. If anyone you know missed it and would be really interested in learning more about sustainable fisheries, I'm trying to get Robin back again sometime or her husband, Jarek, to come and talk <laughs> yeah. again as well. Uh, and we're going to continue to offer these uh, throughout the summer. So keep, keep uh, posted. Thanks again, guys. Thank you, Shane.